channel uh, just wanted to give you a, a bit of a look around my my RS really so uh, obviously my my pride and joy so uh, so go easy on me but yeah I just wanted to uh, let you have a look at it take take for a little drive in it tell you about it why I bought it why I bought this particular one uh, things I've done to it so far some of my plans for it hope you enjoy the video and uh, I'll do my best to uh, answer any questions you've got in the comments and uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe and all that jazz really appreciate it I'm hoping to bring you lots more content on my RS and uh, hopefully on some other kind of interesting modified quirky cars as well Doesn't that sound great? I don't know about you guys, I'm pretty sure I'm never going to get tired of that sound. Anyway, if you're watching this, chances are you already know what the Mark II Focus RS is all about, but just in case you're new to the Ford scene, here's a brief summary. The Mark II Ford Focus RS was launched back in 2009, taking the formula from the already fairly successful Mark II Focus ST and turning it all the way up to 11. Despite the rumours of a four-wheel drive Focus RS, Ford decided that they were going to stick with the front-wheel drive layout from the Focus ST. Apparently, due to costs, it was either the four-wheel drive system or the kind of slightly out there styling with the wide arches and the big rear wing. The four-wheel drive RS, as you all know, ended up having to wait for the Mark III version. To be totally honest though, as much as I'd love to try out a four-wheel drive version of the Mark II RS, I'm, I'm pretty glad that they stuck with the styling. I really think it makes the car look special and it gives the car a lot of road presence. While the ST came from the factory with a still respectable for the time 225 horsepower, the Mark II RS took the same Volvo source 5 pot motor and upped the power output to an impressive 301 horsepower. Thanks in part to a host of upgrades including a larger turbo, new intercooler, forged crankshaft, graphite coated cylinder bores, variable valve timing and silicon aluminium pistons. At the time of the launch, 301 horsepower was considered actually a bit bonkers for a front-wheel drive car. Many of the journalists, car enthusiasts kind of scoffed at that idea, putting so much power through the front wheels. They would say things like, you'll never get all the power down, imagine the torque steer, you know, you guys have probably heard it all before. Well, Ford had a bit of a trick or two up their sleeves to counter that very issue. The engineers at Ford came up with a trick front suspension setup that they called Revo Knuckle. So this provided a lower scrub radius and kingpin offset than the usual front suspension designs. But crucially, it also avoided the extra weight and complexity that double wishbone and multi-link suspension can often entail. Ford also fitted a quaff limited slip differential to the car to help reduce torque steer further. So did it work? Yes, it did. While some torque steer is definitely still present, it really isn't that bad. I think the car handles the standard 301 horsepower with ease, even coping comfortably with a bit more, such as with the Ford approved Mount June MP350 power upgrade fitted to my car and also as standard to the RS500. Performance wise, the standard car can crack 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds and onto a top speed of 163 miles an hour, while the MP350 kit drops that to 5.4 seconds while raising the top speed slightly to 165 miles an hour. So we've had a look at the outside, what about the interior? Well, the Mark II Focus RS interior is actually pretty similar to the facelift Mark II Focus ST interior, save for a few key differences. The most obvious, of course, is the seats. The seats in this car, in my opinion, are stunning. Ford used RS branded Recaro Sports to CS bucket seats in the Mark II RS, either trimmed in a part color coded fabric and part Alcantara, or in the case of my car, part leather and part Alcantara, which is the Dynamica seat upgrade. The seats are incredibly comfortable and they're really supportive at the same time and I think they look great too. Elsewhere in the interior you get the same Ford power start button from the facelift ST along with the faux carbon interior trim. In the RS of course you get a decent helping of RS badging and blue stitching throughout too. The eagle eyed Ford enthusiasts among you will note that the boost gauge in the RS goes all the way up to 1.8 bar rather than 1.2 bar in the ST reflecting of course the bigger turbo and higher boost pressure found in the RS. My particular car is fitted with the Lux 2 option pack, so this gave you the now slightly dated touchscreen sat-nav and a reverse camera, along with all the extras you got with the Lux 1 pack, such as rear parking sensors, keyless entry, 
auto lights, rain sensing wipers, dual zone climate control, auto dimming rear view mirror and more. Unfortunately with the Lux 2 though, you did lose the DAB radio from the Lux 1. Can't have it all I guess. The only other options available on the car aside from the choice of paint was the dynamic seat upgrade that I've already mentioned, plus uh, Bluetooth, USB and voice control. For some reason, the original owner of my car spec'd everything apart from Bluetooth and USB, obviously Bluetooth being pretty useful for streaming your music, and that was despite it being a, a relatively cheap option at the time. Since owning the car, however, I have managed to successfully retrofit Bluetooth and USB using a genuine Ford module, so my car is now fully spec'd. In the rear of these cars, you get a sculpted Recaro bench, which does look rather nice. However, it is worth pointing out that as per the Mark II ST3 spec cars, these are only four seaters and don't have a lap belt in the middle. I don't think many people are really buying these cars to transport five these days, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Overall, I find the interior a really nice place to be, despite the fact that it's not exactly the most modern these days. If I had to moan about something though, I really don't know what Ford were thinking when it came to the cup holders in this car. They're probably among the worst I've ever come across. So. So when setting off for an early morning drive to a breakfast meet or a show, I often like to take my travel mug with me. Pretty standard, right? However, the cup holders are just too shallow for anything really. It will fit my travel mug, but it doesn't really feel secure. It also kind of gets in the way of changing gear, so not really great. And then you can also forget about fitting it in the further back position as the armrest is in the way. Nice one, Ford. I'm sure you probably could have done better. Don't know what happened there, but anyway. So I've told you about the car, I've taken you on a bit of a tour of my RS, now it's time to find out what it's like on the road. vent driving this thing it feels a little bit more I'd say like I know it's my classic car as such but like it feels a little bit more analog you just get in you start it you hear that engine kind of rumble into life and you know you've got no drift mode no track modes no adaptive dampers or anything like that you just you just start it and you drive it and this thing wants to be driven the RS Mark III super clever car I have no doubt in a lot of scenarios it's, it's a better driver's car with the four-wheel drive and all of that. Um, 
but yeah I don't know I just think it's like maybe a little bit less special I'm sorry if you guys disagree and feel free to disagree um, I still love the Mark III RS don't get me wrong and I think if I was dailying it I'd probably buy a Mark III RS um, I think it's probably a better daily car it's a more up-to-date interior better infotainment just newer um, I'm sure it's still got its Ford issues but you know they all do front tyres on there. I've got Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's which are really good. You've also got a limited slip diff fit to the gearbox as standard on this versus not having that in the ST. You've also got Ford's clever Revo knuckle suspension system of course. So um, yeah it, it all helps I think in, don't get me wrong, in, in the dry, uh, sorry in the wet it still can be a bit of a handful and you still can get torque steer in these things. But it's not that bad, honestly, guys. Um, you know, when these cars came out in uh, 2009, there was a lot of talk about can you put 300 horsepower through the front wheels? A lot of people thought it couldn't be done, a lot of people laughed at that. But yes, you can do it, and, and more. I mean, you know, this is 350 PS with this kit, 345 brake horsepower. It copes absolutely fine, apart from maybe in the wet a little bit. but. Yeah, it's, 
it's amazing really what can be done with it. I quite, I quite enjoy the fact it's front wheel drive in some ways as well. It, you know, you know that when it's sort of tugging at the wheel a little bit, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got a bit of character, I guess, is the right thing to say with that. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't let that put you off at all. It's still a really good driver's car. You can feel with these cars, they are quite nose heavy. They're not, you know, that engine's quite heavy. It's quite a big car actually for, you know, what you think is a little hatch, but it's, it's no, it's no Fiesta, it's no mini Fiat 500 above. You, you know, you can feel the size and the weight of this thing. It's, it's no lightweight, but steering's really direct. You point it, it goes, it pulls you through the corner. And these seats, these seats are awesome. The rest of the interior, you know, yeah, it's getting dated by today's standards, but, it's not that bad, it's not it's not ancient. You know, this car's 12 years old, so um, it's doing okay, I guess. This is a Lux 2 car. Sorry, I just had to, had to have a look at the third gear there, because if you've got one of these cars, it's, you just need to do that. Drive it and you'll, you'll understand. Uh, but yeah, this is a Lux 2 car. You've got, obviously, this sat nav, which is obviously getting a bit old. It's got a reverse camera, parking sensors, auto lights, wipers, keyless, auto dimming mirror. I think that's probably about all the, the luxuries I can think of off the top of my head. Folding mirrors and all of that. So yeah, it's, for its age, it's, it's quite reasonably, reasonably spec. I think the interior is, although it is starting to look dated, I think it's aged reasonably well for a car of this era. You've got the fake carbon, got a few other bits the, the plastic on the dash okay that's not not super great i think the seats obviously set this interior apart compared to you know even the st that has some recaros in it but not not the proper buckets like this one these are actually the dynamic or upgraded ones as well which i really wanted when i bought this car so um just rather than the colored fabric you've got the partial leather with the alcantara i think it looks really smart Sadly, I bought it at a time when the prices were quite high. Um, if I'd have been able to be in a position two, three years ago to buy one of these, um, I could have bought, the price I paid for this, no doubt I could have bought an absolute low mileage, mint example, perfect spec, everything that I wanted. Sadly, that is not the case now, and my budget did not stretch to some of those ridiculously pristine garage queen examples that are commanding 
30, 35,000 plus is absolutely mental. Um, I've seen them go for more than that, or certainly advertising more than that, and don't even get me started on RS500s. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so my budget wasn't quite stretching to anything like that. But it was also healthy enough that I didn't have to buy the kind of bargain basement, ultra high mileage, poorly modified examples out there. So this one is actually a little bit higher mileage than I would have liked, and it is what would be classed not crazy high, but certainly a bit high for one of these. It's it's low for a 12 year old Focus, but not especially low for, for an RS. I bought this on 85,000. Um, however, I'm planning probably only to do it, because it's, as I mentioned, it's a weekend car, maybe 2,000 a year, something like that. It's garage the rest of the time. So uh, yeah, it shouldn't go up that quickly. And I, I tried to buy not entirely focused on mileage. I tried to buy focus on the condition of the car and also the spec. And I looked at a few and this was actually the highest mileage of the cars that I looked at within that budget. However, I wanted, wasn't actually fussed on the color, would have taken green or white. Just, I was looking for a good car to be honest. And I'm, this has got quite low owners. It's got a really good service history. It's been serviced every year on the dot, either by Ford or a specialist. It's had the cam belt done. It looks like it's just been dailyed, but by someone that cares about it. It doesn't look like it's been driven like mega hard. It was unmodded apart from the mounting kit, and I thought that was a plus. The mounting kit's really nice to have. Anyway, you know, the MP350 was Ford approved from the factory. So, um, yeah, nice, nice kit and gives me a good base if I do want to go 375 at some point. So that was a plus. I also wanted at least a Lux 1. It wasn't fussed if it was Lux 1 or Lux 2. I just didn't want the kind of super basic uh, you know, non-climate aircon and you know, all the other kind of little bits, you know, the auto lights and wipers and bits and bobs you get with the Lux packs. I wanted that. And I also wanted these upgraded seats. So yeah, you know, good condition car, well cared for, right spec. And yeah, found, found this one. So, um, and the others I looked at, they either had you know, low, you know, same sort of budget, they were lower mileage as I said, but you know, they had other issues like random unknown remaps, dubious modifications, some dubious, you know, history, extra, you know, lot, lots of owners, all that kind of stuff. Um, or just, some of them are just cosmetically quite tatty as well in places and this is not this was not and it's not perfect don't get me wrong but it looked like a really good honest car and I drove it and it drove really well everything felt tight everything just you know nice and smooth everything about it was just pointing me towards this one so uh, yeah it's kind of how I ended up with with this car it wasn't also it was only about 40 minutes away from where I live I would have driven pretty much anywhere with, within reason for, for the right car. I've, I have actually, you know, I live on in Dorset, on the sort of south coast of the UK. I've actually flown up to Scotland for a car in the past, so I'm genuinely no stranger to kind of uh, doing that. done so far to the car so I've been trying to concentrate really on, on mostly just tidying the car up so far I have I got uh, gel overlays for the four badges so the badges on these seem to um, just fade in the sun after a while so initially I was like yeah I'll just go and buy some new uh, RS badges we bought there's four of them one on front one on the back one on each wing um, turns out they're like 40 odd quid each for a plastic RS badge, and I was like, no thanks. Um, so I ended up going to DMB. Every, you know, everybody knows DMB that's in the in the Ford scene. Anyway, got my RS overlays from them, absolutely spot on. Loads of people use them. Change the look of those. I'll show you in the video. Um, I got a new Mountune badge from Mountune, which I had to buy because that was kind of faded. Um, 
believe it or not, guys, if you get, you know, if you want to get a mounting badge, you have to like, well, if you want to buy a front mounting anyway, you have to prove that you have a proper mounting car. So I had to send them a copy of my mounting certificate that came in the history file of the car and my VIN number, and they had to like authorize this was a proper mounting car. Good news, it was. I was a bit worried for a second, but anyway, so sent sent me one of those. I also at the same time bought one of their open cone air filters that goes inside the mounting airbox. It's just giving me a little bit more induction noise because it's open on one end. I have done a, as I mentioned, a, a de-res on the exhaust just as a sort of temporary solution until I'm able to justify the cat back and everything. So uh, that's on there, it was about a hundred quid. Garage did that for me. I fitted EBC yellow stuff from pads and grooved discs because the front brakes needed doing it anyway. While I was there, I tidied up the calipers. They were a dull, kind of rusty, you know, unpainted, I think they're silver from the factory, but you know, just years of not being painted, they've got a kind of dull, rusty color. So I've gone with like the RS500 style. I might do another video possibly about how I did that and created the little plaques with the RS badges, but yeah, I've done that. Uh, what else? Changed the um, wing mirror indicators. The lenses were going a bit funny on those. Oh yeah, I got myself some proper RS mats. It came with proper focus mats, but rubber ones for some reason. So I've got proper, proper RS ones. You can still buy them, fortunately, directly from Ford at the moment. Probably not for much longer, so uh, get your order in for those if you need if you need some. If they, they might go like the Mark 1 Focus RS mats, I guess. They're like super expensive to buy on eBay and second hand. So uh, I'm tempted to buy a, a spare set and keep them in the bag, to be honest just in case I have like a kind of usable set and a, and a show set, but probably a waste of money, maybe not, who knows. I'm, I've got some EBC pads to fit on the back at some point, I just need to get the discs, just so that they all match in. They're also nice because they've got that kind of plated bit around the hub so they don't go rusty after a while and you don't need to paint them, they're just like a nice kind of, I think it's like zinc plated or something, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, next on the list, I think I'm due a wheel refurb. The wheels are not curbed, they're not in bad condition. They're just, they're getting old. They are, a couple of them are starting to like corrode a little bit on the inside around the wheel nuts as they do. Speaking of which, also I changed those wheel nuts. Standard Ford wheel nuts of this era. You guys probably know, terrible, they've got the little plastic caps on. They just kind of get kind of weird and mushy and just, yeah, it's, it's bad. You could end up not being able to get a wheel off of those, so I'll put a link in the description. I got a set off eBay, about 20 quid, proper solid metal ones. Look basically the same as the originals, but they're solid metal. 100% recommend you do that for like 20 quid. But yeah, the, uh, the wheel refurb is, is definitely on the cards next, just to tidy the wheel area up a bit more. So I'll have new brakes, freshly painted calipers, wheel refurb, it's going to look the part down there. Um, after that, yeah, maybe maybe that Mountain 375 kit, like I said, at some point. Oh yeah, another thing that I did actually recently, which I can't believe I forgot, was uh, the, when I bought this, the intercooler, the Mountain one, was quite stone chipped, there was a bit of paint flaking off the kind of scoop on the bottom, um, so it was really detracting from the front end of the car. Also the, uh, particularly the lower front grille, that was uh, just starting to sort of go a little bit rusty here and there. Not, you know, not too bad, but again, just all, all sort of detracting from the front end of the car a little bit. So I decided I needed to sort that out. So what I ended up doing was uh, taking the front bumper off, stripping it all down, taking the intercooler out, splitting the grills out. The grills are really fiddly to get out, by the way. They've got these horrible little clips on them. Absolute nightmare, but sorted it sent the grills off to be sandblasted and powder coated and they've come back lovely gloss black all the rust has been removed it's been removed uh, and while that was happening i took the intercooler out cleaned that all down sprayed that all up and also put the mount tune uh, logo on it with a stencil that i purchased from mount tune so um yeah, i'll put the link in the description for that as well i think it looks pretty cool i was like you know what i'll give it a try if i don't like it i can blow over it in black at some point it's no big deal, but yeah, quite liking it so far. Also, 
that's reminded me when I bought this the headlights were absolutely terrible not cosmetically they were fine driving this thing at night was like driving blind I swear if it was an on lit road now I had a obviously as I mentioned the Mark II Focus ST back in the day uh, with literally the same headlights they're, they're by Xenon and I remember back in the day thinking these lights are really really good um, they were the best lights I'd had on the car at that time you know factory Xenons lit the road up beautifully drove it home when I bought it on the motorway and I was like wow these are great lights the same could, the same could not be said for this car honestly terrible um, so I did a bit of research and turns out it's really common on these Mark II focuses I think particularly the facelift but I'm not 100% sure on that that the basically what it is the projector lens the kind of chrome bit behind that kind of burns out and goes black and dull over time so it kind of loses its reflect uh, loses its reflectivity and obviously that therefore affects the light output the fix for that is generally well from Ford is to buy new headlights but from Ford themselves you're looking kind of eight nine hundred a grand something like that for a pair of lights which is obviously not really what you want to do um, and they were working enough they would have passed an MOT but they just Honestly, it's like borderline dangerous on an unlit road at night. A bit more research, I found out you could use a company, what was the name of them? It's a company called Retrofit Lab, and they sold retrofit upgrade projector kits that fit inside the original lights. Um, not the easiest thing to fit because you either have to remove the lenses of the lights or cut into the plastic of the lights as there's not enough room to go through the, you know, the the holes where you uh, insert the bolt. So I wasn't particularly keen on that initially, but shout out to um, Car Focused. I saw his video, um, how he did it on his ST. Um, so going underneath the lights, um, cutting two or three little slits, I think it was, using a hot air gun just to heat that up. And then being able to bend the tab, get them that way, resealing it. So I ended up having to go at that. It cost me, I think, what, a couple of hundred quid or so overall. They come from the Netherlands, so you've got to pay import tax, whatever now, Brexit. Uh, but yeah, really good quality products uh, fitted them, and they're lovely and bright again, just like you know, driving my old ST. So, really pleased I sorted that because that was really bugging me, especially driving that over winter. And I bought this thing to drive over winter as well, like, not. Like I said, it's, it is a weekend car. I'm not probably going to take it out deliberately when it's chucking it down with rain and it's absolutely miserable all the time, but it does, it is going to go out, you know, nice days in winter and evenings like that. I don't want it just sat there all year. I bought this thing to drive it at the end of the day. Like I said, not daily, not loads of miles, but I'm not, I don't want to go six months without driving it. It's, you know, it's, it's here to have, have some fun and, um, yeah, obviously in the winter months, having headlights that were like candles wasn't really ideal. My two other cars that are daily driven have ordinary halogen headlights, and I was just getting in those. Oh my God, these halogen lights are just 10 times better than the Xenons in my RS, which was just stupid. So uh, I've also put some new 6,000K bulbs in there. I think they were an eBay purchase as well um, so yeah that's made them look nice and white as well I guess so there you have it guys I've taken you on a tour of my Mark II Focus RS I've told you what it's like to drive I've talked about some of the things I've done to it so far and some of my future plans for the car I hope you've enjoyed watching the video of course I'd really appreciate it if you could like and subscribe I'm planning to bring you lots more content on my RS and other cool cars so make sure you check that out and yeah, let me know what you think of the Mark II Focus RS in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll catch you soon in the next video.